we're doing a bit of a double double act, but I'm I'm going to spend a couple of minutes introducing uh, the site of the Scorpius Cove. It's quite an enigmatic um, site before Christina takes over and uh, rounds you with her acoustic work um, at the caves. So just to give you an idea of where we are, um, kind of closing with place, we're you know we're in a very very specific place here, up in the, the far northeast of Scotland on the Murray Firth, um, a series of sea caves. Uh, one of which the Scorpius Cave is known quite well archaeologically, um, excavated in the late 1920s and uh, 1970s, um, and currently um, being published by myself and being on it. Um, caves, you know, from from prehistory to the present day are are well known in the literature as being extremely liminal places, um, sort of um, ontologically. Uh, this is no different from the county caves. Um, you can see them here, they're, uh, they're located halfway between land and sea. Uh, they're obviously as caves, they're halfway between um, the sort of above ground world of the living and the underworld of the dead and the ancestors, and I'll show you um, how the dead and the ancestors play into the particular sites in a minute. Um, the landscape that you see today um, is the product of um, agricultural improvement in the medieval period. There was a huge sea lock called the Lock of Spiny, which actually cut off. Um, the, this whole suit of land, um, so really, you know, it was a very, very difficult place to get to, and it really did exist between between sort of uh, the worlds of, of the living on the land and, and the worlds of the dead and the sea. Um, and of course, there's lots and lots of folklore which hooks caves up with the wild, the unfamiliar, the supernatural, and that, so we already have very, very charged, powerful places, um, and that's reflected in the kinds of archaeology that we see in caves and the kinds of archaeology that we see specifically at the Cowsey Caves. The most famous, I said, of which is the Sculptor's Cave. Uh, this is the Sculptor's Cave here. You can see a photograph of, um, of the Sculptor's Cave in its little bay here. It gets cut off when we go over the field over there. It gets cut off from the access point and from the other caves that we work in. For about four hours, I'm either, either side of high tide. Uh, from a 21st century point of view, there's no mobile reception either, so you are literally completely cut off. Uh, uh, the people that have to sign for a risk assessment at the University of London. Um, you can see uh, the, the inside of the school to take here, but it's really interesting, very unusual twin entrance passages. Um, and it's called the Sculptor's Cave because of these pictures, these early medieval symbols that adorn the entrance walls. Now, the picture symbols only occur in the entrance passages, but <coughs> itself is quite significant as this kind of liminal threshold area between the, the light filled outside and the dark filled interior of the cave. So, um, quite deliberately placed. Yeah, that's all. No problem. The cave has seen, uh, this particular cave, the Scots Cave, has seen a very, very long history of use in prehistory. Um, all of this use, kind of ritual, votive, mortuary in character, nothing particularly domestic, which is not surprising considering how difficult these caves are to get to. Um, in the late Bronze Age, we had a series of stake alignments, stake structures across those twin entrance passages. Uh, associated with those are lots and lots of disarticulated human remains, particularly of juveniles, adorned with items of finery such as gold containers like this. Again, a lot of this activity seems to be taking place um, in those kind of liminal entrance passages. Uh, the pre-Roman Iron Age, we have a lot of uh, a lot of activity. None, none of it seems to be particularly mortuary in character. We've got a lot of hearths, lots of pottery vessels, things um, that indicate that people are doing lots of stuff in there, and presumably surrounded by bits of bits of late Bronze Age human body as they do it. Uh, Sylvia mentioned the first excavation site, you know, noticed in the 19, uh, late 1920s that the floor was human human bones. That was obviously being taken in the Iron Age as well. Uh, we get more luxury activity in the Roman Iron Age. Um, looks like laying out bodies as part of normative funerary processes. Again, laid out with all their finery uh, and punctuated by a very violent decapitation event in the third century. Uh, presumably, again, ritualised to some extent because it's taking place in a very, very difficult place to get to. So that's just to give you the background to the archaeology of the Sculptor's Cave and you know why we've put so much effort and focus into our reanalysis and publication of this site. So the Cowsey Cave's project not only looks to um, publish the Sculptor's Cave archive, but also augment that archive with new theoretical and technological uh, approaches, including terrestrial laser scanning, uh, so producing track plans and sections through terrestrial laser scanning, 
uh, structured light scanning for carvings, trying to elicit more details. And we've got a really good walkthrough model um, on YouTube that I can give you the link to later. Um, and, and excavation of other of the caves, which is again throwing up similar kinds of um, activity <laughs> to the Sculptor's Cave. So we're not looking at a unique site in the Sculptor's Cave, we're actually looking at a coastal mortuary landscape. Um, and this is really where Christina's work fits in. And I'll hand over to her now. Um, so she's come up with us um, to, again, give us um, a different dimension to the sense of these places and the activity that's taking place there. Over to you, Christina. All right. <clears throat> so my work is um, part of my... I work at, at the University of Huddersfield, and my project is RASP project. And um, I was brought into this in, from my supervisor, Rupert Till, who came in 2014 with um, and brought musicians and took some impulse responses and made a response to the space called the sound the songs of sculptors that's is it songs or sounds I don't know but um, so and there's him and then there's me looking very very happy with the balloon and um, so part of the songs of sculptors cave involved taking impulse responses recordings um, and making kind of an artistic and compositional response to the space. And I'll have an example here where can go on the Rupert Chills SoundCloud and hear the rest. Um, so then when I, I came in July, no June of this year and I took some additional measures, I also took a lot of photos and I also, I did sort of a deep listening inspired um, kind of sound walk and ambis taking ambisonic recordings of some of the areas and focusing on um, on liminality, where the where it just happened to be that the acoustics were sort of focused on these three er areas of liminality in the space, which would be the ocean, like the edge of the world, the entrance to the cave, which had a very interesting resonance, like a seashell resonance, and then I did, and then I combined those recordings that I did with a an acoustic model that I did using. The information that uh, the archaeological information on the Bronze Age cave, where it had a stagnant water pool, and possible um, obstructions, and and also of the sounds of some of the the things that were mentioned in the monograph, namely kind of beetles and the other bug-like sounds of decay that and you know fire sounds that would um, alter the sound of your the sound of the acoustics in this cave where you um, have a stagnant water pool and in acoustically a stagnant water pool will reflect sound back to you and when combined with this sense of liminality this kind of strange water barrier where there were offerings is what does that sound like how does how were the acoustics different there and so part of my creative output of this was a sound walk like a virtual sound walk through these Ver these um, liminal areas. Um, and so some of the sounds that I focused on were obviously the ocean. Everyone likes the ocean. Um, birds, which in a lot of early writings, the birds have, you know, they kind of talk like people. And the ones who live next to this cave kind of sound a bit crying in a way. They kind of go, like, whee! Um, just the cave entrance itself and the recording that I made of the seashell resonance in this cave, the sound of going between this sort of loud area and then approaching the quiet, where these, um, the, the two um, entrances are strangely quiet. And then, and then the sound of the ocean goes away when you get towards the back. It's, it's very low. And then, um, and then you approach this next liminal slash acoustic space, which is the stagnant water pool with the little tiny crackling sounds of either bugs or fire or 
maybe just the sound of coldness, the sound of drips, that sort of thing. Or maybe even a little ocean, like not like ocean life, but like weird bug ocean life, that kind of thing. And so I just explained that. Um, and so one of the things that I found the most interesting about my recordings there was the resonance at the entrance, which is I found very interesting just because it was unexpected for me. Maybe other people would have expected it. And I was also able to reproduce it in the acoustic model, so I was quite happy about that. But just because it was like, great, it's not all in my head, you know? But, you know it's not just my ears or is anything. But so I wanted to um, play a little bit of this tone, and then, I, and then after that I will kind of signpost to where you could explore the sound. And so it's not a video, it's a 3D recording, so it's easiest presented where you can go into cardboard mode and listen with your headphones and go like that. And, and so, but I wanted to show you the tone because it's interesting from a liminal where you come from a place where there is no, no acoustic and then you end up in a place where there's tone and then you end up in a place where it's quiet. And so hopefully you can hear the tone. I don't know, the speakers are all the way up there. If you, um, I tried to name them things so you can look up tag presentation and sculptor's cave and you can go on your phone at some point. And so, no, you don't want to let me through? Come on. All right. So part of my, then those are my recordings. So then what I wanted to do is to explore how the sound of the cave would have changed using virtual acoustics. And so I, I made these, the, um, uh, you can see the different reference points, and I did those based on um, where I had made measures and also where they were, where they're visually relevant. Like they're not in a line because caves aren't linear, you know, if you go in a straight line, you hit a wall or you're in the ceiling or something. And then I also found places on the edge of the pool to look at. And then, um, so then, the form of the output that I did is um, basically the three ranges of liminality, um, where I do start at the, the edge of the world, as I mentioned, the marginal space, which is the tone area, and then entering a bizarrely quiet place. Two minutes on it. And then, um, and then the, the meeting at the cave, where you go and you visit with your stagnant water friends. And then, um, so, I have in this a one minute oralization so that you could hear how the sounds change since there's not really so much time for this, but it's just clapping and the virtual acoustics of it. And so you can hear, if you just, so this is one, nothing. That's very different. You can hear the kind of the next one. You hear the tone a little bit. Sorry, I'll just go towards the end. And you can hear it. It's a little bit. There's a, there's a little bit of a change. It's not really represented in, in this. You'd have to go to my YouTube. And then, um, but so, so the reason I had made this piece was interest in these liminal spaces and also so that you could explore it yourself. So what you would do is um, you would go to YouTube and you would go on your phone and go in cardboard mode, put in your headphones, 
at some point, maybe when you're by yourself, so no one can see you doing it. And then um, you just sort of take an eight-minute sound meditation where you use this as sort of your... I'm, I know. Yes. But so you do your eight-minute sound meditation where you go and you listen, and then you can go click on the bookmarks in the video to s listen to the different places and find them and reflect on them. And that's it. And so thank you. <laughs>